And joining us now here in the studio, Dr. Joseph Cafazzo. He is lead of the Center for Global eHealth Innovation, part of the University Health Network here in Toronto. And it's nice to have you here in our Thanks. studio. Thanks for having me. Let's start with the background. Just tell us what this center does for starters. Well, the center was created about uh, eight years ago, uh, first opened its doors, and it was uh, it was the brainchild of uh, actually a frequent guest of the agenda is Al Dr. Alex Haddad, who you've had on a number of times. Indeed. And uh, the idea was to look at the status of uh, healthcare innovations and technologies and, and create better technologies uh, through the use of uh, scientists who are specialists in this area, multidisciplinary groups, uh, getting nurses and, and doctors involved in the design of technology, human factors engineers, computer scientists, social scientists. Everybody gets technology as it relates to working in a hospital, but the thing that I'm interested in is the, the use of medical technology at home mm. in terms of improving home care. What mm -hmm. can you tell us about that? How important is that these days? It's increasingly important because we're not really, well, the healthcare system is growing, but our capacity to care for the aging demographic is, is becoming very difficult. So how do we do that? And, and you know, patients want to stay at home. They don't want to be hospitalized. Uh, they'd like to be able to manage their own care. And some of the tools that we're creating at the center is trying to facilitate self-care, self-management. Uh, and I think that's good for them and that's good for the system as well. Look at the monitor over my shoulder because we're going to roll some tape right now of a demonstration of something you guys have developed called the BANT app which you've developed for diabetic teenagers. And if we can roll that tape right now, let's have you describe what we're seeing in these pictures. So what you're seeing is uh, an individual taking uh, a blood sample. You can see that they've applied it to the test strip. This is what diabetics do several times a day. They pull the strip and you're gonna see that the application is automatically launched. It detects this Bluetooth signal that is being uh, detected and this signal is going to be the reading is automatically <laughs> transferred over to the, the iPhone. Woohoo is a technical term, I guess? Uh, well, it's fun. <laughs> I think what we're trying to do is make this a little bit more bearable for adolescents with diabetes. This is something that is difficult for them to do on their own. This is a transitional period in their life, and we're trying to make uh, disease management easier for them. So this is a smartphone or tablet app that's right. Like any other that you can download into your personal device. Right. And it helps you regulate your health care. Well, this, is, this particular app is, uh, is in the trial phase. It's regulated. So it's not <laughs> widely available. There is a version that is simplified that allows you to manually enter data. But the version that you see here that has this Bluetooth connectivity to your medical device falls under the regulations of the Food and Drug Act, and it's, it's, we're working through that system, and hopefully it'll be more widely available. Now, as you just pointed out, it's supposed to be a little bit more fun, and mm. presumably, by making it fun, you can actually get teenagers or younger people to, to do something with more regularity that they otherwise wouldn't like to do? Is that well, the idea? One of the things that they don't like doing is taking these regular blood sugar measurements. It requires a finger prick. Sometimes they have to do it at school. It's perhaps embarrassing for them. Uh, so, you know, we asked them what they wanted out of this. They wanted something that was simple. They didn't want a lot of cables. They wanted something that could easily capture their blood sugar readings on their mobile phone. And what we decided to do is, is try some behavioral interventions that haven't been tried before in this group. In, in particular, we added social media aspects to it. So uh, there's a BANT community in there that individuals uh, who, are, who are using the app can share their experiences through this microblogging feature and also the gaming or, or what we call the gamification aspects of the of the app in that they they're earning experience points every time they take a, a blood sugar reading they earn points and eventually they can redeem them for itunes music itunes apps and so on so lots of incentive to actually yeah. do what you don't necessarily like doing yeah gotcha what separates your app from other educational programs or therapies for diabetes I think what we're trying to do is that it, it is firmly based in a lot of the behavioral sciences in, in terms of it has prompting and reminders, it has the ability to uh, identify trends. It is trying to, like many of the kids know what they're supposed to be doing, it's just trying to get them to do it. I think what we're trying to introduce here is uh, some new aspects in terms of the social media and the gamification as well as this is one of the first examples of uh, a mobile phone communicating with a medical device mm. wirelessly. 
and, uh, and it's something that's trying to simplify the data capture. Uh, the data capture in of itself is probably not going to change behavior, but it's at least making some self-awareness. And all this data is being stored into their personal health record that can be shared with their parents and their endocrinologist as well. But it's private otherwise? It's private, yeah. Your sh the, the security concerns have been met. That's right. It's using a platform, TELUS Health Space, that has been uh, already certified by Canada Health InfoWay as being secure. Okay. I, I can imagine people watching are already saying, BANT, BANT. What, what do they call mm. it BANT for? Why is it called BANT? It's, it's a riff on Frederick Banting, uh, who discovered the ins insulin in, in 1921. And uh, it was just something we were trying to kick around names, and we looked at the, the, sort of the heritage of this. I, you know, I'm a professor at the University of Toronto. The, the app was built at Toronto General Hospital. These were uh, two organizations that, uh, that Frederick Banting was part of when he first discovered insulin back almost um, over 90 years ago. Now. now, I can see Michael Bliss having a real problem with this right now because he wrote that book, The Discovery of Insulin, and it yes. was Banting and Best and Call Up yes, and there's four of them. Yes, there's four of them. But the so that's a very long app name. I think. <laughs> well, the descendants of the other three are not going to be happy that Banting's well, getting all the glory here. Perhaps we will have different versions. How's that? <laughs> that highlight each of the contributors. I'm just saying. Anyway, okay. Um, Let's move on and talk. There really are, you know, thousands of medical and health and wellness apps mm. out there. And I guess we should get into some discussion here about how good or bad they are. But mm. start with this. Are they regulated by anybody? Uh, whether or not they're, well, it's, it's really about the enforcement at this point. So, yes, technically they're, they are regulated. Uh, nothing has really changed if, if whether or not a, a piece of software for patient self-management is on a personal computer or on your mobile phone, it makes no difference. So the existing laws actually do apply. And so Health Canada and the Food and Drug Act say that, you know, if you have an application that modifies clinical data and, and affects decision making, uh, then it is regulated, it is a medical device. If, you're, if an application is communicating with a medical device, then it in fact is a medical device itself. So uh, the FDA has weighed in on this, they have uh, produced guidance. Uh, Health Canada has reiterated the Food and Drug Act that it does apply. Whether or not they're enforcing that, that's something that I think they're, they're going to do. Are um, there bad apps out there? There are some apps that have crossed the line. For example? Uh, wh whether or not, well, apps that actually, again, manipulate or interpret clinical data and provide information to the patient, that, that has to go through uh, a rigorous regulatory process in order to be approved. And, uh, you know, I can't say that there's anything necessarily harmful out there right now. Uh, to my knowledge, there, there hasn't been anything. But, but there are apps, and, the, and there has been one instance in the U.S. that the FCC actually took down uh, a, a dermatology app, an app that is supposed to, you know, be able to treat skin blemishes that simply uses the, the LED on the, uh, the flash LED that's on the camera on a, on a mobile phone. And it, they're making a false claim, and that's why the FCC... Uh, stepped in and asked uh, Apple to pull down that particular app. But there's been very few examples of that yet, uh, currently. Uh, I would expect there to be more in the future. So and, the, and now there's greater awareness from app developers that they need to go through this process. So. So, so that one you just talked about from Apple didn't meet a certain threshold, but you wouldn't go so far as to call that a scam. It is, it is not, uh, there's no clinical evidence. They're making a false claim that an LED light on your mobile phone could could treat skin, skin blemishes. So it's interesting that it was the FCC and not the FDA that actually requested the pull down. Why is that interesting? Well, it's FDA is, is, is in particular, is supposed to be regulating uh, medical uh, aspects, but the FCC to decided to step in and on the basis that it's a false claim, false advertising, in ah, a sense. I see, okay. Uh, all right, let's talk about who uses these things. A teenager with diabetes using the BANT as you just described it, mm. you know, Teens are very hip to the apps nowadays. Mm -hmm. They can figure all that stuff out. But how about a senior mm -hmm. with a chronic illness? Yeah. How do you develop an app that somebody who is not particularly tech savvy can figure yeah. out? Well, we, you know, before we developed BANT, we, we developed uh, a number of applications that were on the BlackBerry for, for some other serious conditions, such as uh, high blood pressure. And we, in fact, did a large trial with patients uh, of 60, 70, 80 years of age where they were asked to take their blood pressure on a regular basis and we tracked them over a year, and they did just fine. Um, you know, the mobile phone is a ubiquitous device. It's probably the most popular consumer device in existence, and seniors use them too. If you design the software suitably, 
uh, there's really no reason why they cannot use that technology. So is it an unfortunate stereotype to assume that uh, somebody who's 80 or I 85 absolutely. can't do it? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously you have to be thoughtful in the design of the application and you know, we were very deliberate in terms of having a high level of automation, um, very large text, simple messaging, and very few button clicks on that particular app. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, they did very well and we saw a, a huge improvement in their hypertension management over a one year period. Hmm. How prevalent do you see these apps becoming in people's being able to handle their own health care? Well, I hope it is a trend. I think it's going to happen slowly. I, I think the, the trend in for providers, uh, healthcare providers, that that is a that is a, a given. That's going to happen. But for patients, I think there's a somewhat of a lack of awareness of the apps, and uh, but I think it is needed in that I, I view that I view the opportunity as as a way of them being able to manage their own care, and the phone simply being a conduit for communication. And, and information and tools that allows them to manage their own care. And I think that's important because to a certain extent we have to lower the dependency of individuals who have chronic disease on the healthcare system because we can't really grow it any more than we already have. It's gonna crowd out other important social programs and education and so on, which are also important determinants of health. I don't have to tell you, chronic illnesses cost the healthcare system in this country billions and billions of dollars. About 80% of our healthcare spending is, is related to chronic disease. Right. Do you think medical apps can bring down the cost we spend on that? You know, I'm not going to make huge claims, but, but it is, uh, again, over the years, I, I'm hoping that it is viewed as, an, as a way of providers of reaching out to their patients and having them do more for themselves. You know, between visits, an average person uh, who, with a chronic disease only spends one or two hours with their health care provider per year, over four visits. Mm -hmm. There's still 5,000 hours there, opportunities for them to, to reach out in a very simple way and manage chronic disease in, uh, using mobile phones. The Bant app. How much did it cost to develop? Oh, all told, probably a couple hundred thousand dollars. And do you, I mean, do you research, charge for it? Research grants. Research grants. Do you yes. charge for it? To get no, the we, we don't. And, and it is a research project currently. The free version is out there already. And again, the free version is, is greatly simplified. It's below the regulatory threshold. Uh, but, you know, we do believe, and, and we're going to continue to do research trials on it and, and bring it through the regulatory process. I'd like to keep the barriers to entry very low. Uh, the business models aren't very clear. Let's, certainly, if we are able to demonstrate improved glycemic control in these kids, or, or in adults for that matter, then there may be a benefit to the system. Right now, all we're showing is that through the app, we can get these kids to test more frequently. And our trial at SickKids showed that these kids test 50% more frequently when using band, when, hmm. when not using band. So that's a start, but we really want to bring down uh, their hemoglobin A1C, which is their prime indicator for glycemic control, into the normal range. And so that's gonna require more study, more behavioral intervention, and uh, more tweaking of the app. My hunch is these same kids uh, are content to pay a buck or two for every time they download a tune from iTunes. Yeah. So does that suggest to you that they might pay a buck or two for this, and is this a potential moneymaker for your, you know, your it, institution? You know, if you, if you think about, although it's, it's highly pre prevalent, uh, if you still, if you count up the number of people with type 1 diabetes in Canada, it's, it's probably only about 100,000 people. So. Uh, if I got 100% penetration, that's still only $100,000, <laughs> right? So the business yeah. models, again, aren't, aren't yeah. particularly cl clear. But I think for someone like the strip uh, manufacturers, so the people who build these glucometers, those strips are a dollar each. And mm -hmm. if, if, if this product increases the consumption of strips, I think that pays for itself. In our last minute here, do you think apps such as the ones we've been talking about here are going to revolutionize healthcare delivery? I, I don't think I can make that claim. I, I, I would give it time. It's very new. I think most people, right now, smartphone penetration is only about 30, 40, 50%. Uh, but give it time. And I think now is the time that people are starting to get uh, their heads wrapped around the idea of medical apps. And uh, there's more people building them. So I'm, I'm encouraged by that. Good stuff. Dr. Joseph Cafazzo, thanks for coming into TVO Terrific. tonight, helping us out with this. Thank you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.